Let me start with introduction to applied Islamic ethics. Uh, before even coming to the priorities, and on, no, we start with the priorities. You have the three points here. And I want you to, to be clear on, on one thing that we can discuss. We may disagree on that. We may disagree on that. We may disagree on our understanding of what is the priority with our religion. And I, won't, I wouldn't have a problem with this. But uh, all what I'm doing, and all I'm trying to, to uh, I have been trying to do over the last 25 years, and what I'm trying to expose here, is really something which has to do with a specific understanding of Islam is the way I understand Islam, and I think that Islam is within this long tradition over the century, over, over centuries. So this is why we have to start to discuss and not just to come to all the conclusions of what I'm saying. And this understanding of Islam is starting with, there are four points that I wanted to raise. The first one is that the revelation and the last revelation, after all the revelations that we had over human history, are here to help human beings to remain faithful to the first uh, contract, al mithaq al awal between Allah and human beings. So why I'm also coming to the translation of the etymology of Sharia, the way towards faithfulness, is really this understanding our main duty as Muslims today, bearing the last revelation, is the duty of faithfulness. So it's to be faithful to this uh, contract, meaning faithful to Allah, al-amana, na'radna al-amana, the amana that was given to human beings. It's a, 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 a trust, and this is something that is um, important. Uh, so, the first point is really faithfulness to this uh, mithaq, to this uh, amana. Iman is an amana, and that we have to be faithful. <coughs> the second uh, dimension of understanding, this understanding of Islam, is that what we have to do as Muslims in this world is related to us and related to the world, is to reform ourselves and to reform the world. So this understanding of Islam, faithfulness, is all about knowing what is, what are the principles that are immutable, and know it what, not, not knowing what is changing. So to reform is, in the name of the immutable principles, to change over time, to remain faithful to this principle. So the point is really about <clears throat> this moving, accepting that we have to move, that we have to reform, and to have reform ourselves and to reform the world. But what does it mean here? Is that, that we have a duty, that as we are evolving, as we are moving, we have to reform means that this last revelation is telling us the only way for us to be faithful to this relationship to God is to change ourselves and to change the world for the better. So we have a duty to reform and to change the world, not only to protect ourselves within the world or in this history of human history. So it's a contract with Allah through which he's asking us, the only way for you to be faithful to me is to change this world for the better. It means that we have a responsibility. This responsibility is to change, as I said, ourselves. It's educating our heart, educating our mind, but also changing the world. So at the end of the day, the autonomous human being, el mukallaf which uh, who in front, before Allah, has to uh, face up to his or her responsibility is exactly this. 
there is no faithfulness to the first agreement, contract with Allah if we don't change ourselves to be better human beings and change the world to be a better place to live in. So, if I'm saying this, it's, it's really the starting point of the discussion is when the people are saying, okay, you live in the West, it's not really your place, try to protect yourself, I don't agree. The Sufi trend saying, pray during the night and, 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 and change yourself and forget the world, I don't agree. So it's an understanding of Islam. It's a comprehensive understanding of Islam. We are here with a mission, not to convert the people, but to change the world for the better. I don't have the duty to convert anyone. It's not of my business, but I have to change this world. Wherever I am, when I'm saying la ilaha illallah means change it, do it better. In my house, in my neighborhood, in my uh, 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 society, wherever I am, change yourself, change the world. This is to be faithful. And this is where Islam is very demanding. Because it's, it's uh, knowing at the same time that لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها Allah doesn't ask for anyone what she or he cannot do. But what he or she can do, she or he has to do it. Which is very demanding. You all know here, we all know in this room that we are not at the level of what we can do. Uh, people, yesterday I was talking with one of the brothers saying, how can you do this the whole day and, and you are involved and, and, and still. And, and he is telling me this while I know that I'm not at the level of what I can do. Not with you now, but in my life. You know, this not being satisfied, knowing that Allah, at one point, people can look at, at you and say, oh, you are doing a lot. And you yourself, when you are alone, say, it could be better than that or it could be more effective. That uh, it's always like this. It's when you are doing and you feel that uh, it could be better, as the Prophet ﷺ was saying, look at the people who are doing more than you. And uh, uh, when uh, you don't feel that you have enough, look at the people who have less than you. Always look at a situation which is constructive for you, it's positive, it's pushing you ahead. Uh, so this is the second, uh, the third dimension, which is really what I was saying, is changing the world. And by changing the world, the last point of this, the fourth point of this, is to change the world means for us to contribute. So wherever we are, whatever we do, in every field we are, it could be in, in you know, social work, psychology, medicine, uh, university, uh, whatever, in, in, in your uh, uh, workplace, what is your contribution? In which way you are contributing? <coughs> so this is where faith is visible. Faith is visible through your contribution. What are you giving? In which way you are a gift? If you think that it's not by accident that you are in Britain, you might have an option. It's not by accident because you are perceived as a problem. It's not an, an a by accident because you should be perceived as a gift, a contribution. So it's one, faithfulness. No faithfulness without accepting change. No understanding of change without reforming for the better yourself and the society and contributing to the future of your society, wherever you are, your contribution. And it's not by accident, you know, even when I'm talking about Western Muslims, all this business of, oh, you have to integrate, I say, it's over for me. It's the time of contribution. It's a post-integration discourse on contribution. Okay? I have, it's over. We, have, we are now British. You are British. We are Europeans. What is our contribution? In which way Islam coming back to Europe could be a contribution to the European cultures and the European society? And it's the same in the Muslim majority country. So this is an understanding of Islam which has to do with the priorities when it comes to applied ethics. So when I was asked why to call it and to qualify it as Islamic, because it's Islamic, it's coming from an understanding of Islam, and now it has to be applied wherever we are in all the fields that we are tackling today. With this in mind, applied ethics should be 
uh, the way we think about the ends in order to reform the way we are uh, implementing things. So ethics, it's for the sake of change, positive change, changing for the better, changing for the good. This is why we are talking about uh, applied ethics. Why are we talking about ethics in economy? Because we want to change uh, the, the direction of the current economic order, which is economy without ethics, politics without ethics, it's art without ethics. So our call for more ethics is to change and to reform. You understand the connection? This is why we are talking about applied ethics. And, and you need to keep this in mind when we are going to talk about culture and arts, is what is your contribution? Is it to, the, to do as the others are doing? Or do you have to add something, the added value? You know, uh, we were talking about, you were, I think that you remember when we were meeting at European Muslim Network recently, about uh, what Delors, Jacques Delors was saying, giving a soul to Europe. A soul. A soul means something which is unifying, which is the meaning of our you know, common journey. And for us, the soul is connected, the Islamic soul, or the soul of the Muslims, wherever they are, is based on not only the spiritual yearning, but also the ethical implementation, the ethical translation of our uh, uh, yearning to God, to Allah. So all this is connected. So, so I, I want you to understand that the practical, the translation in practice should have this as a philosophy behind. And you may disagree with this. You know, when some Salafi are telling me, no, they are reading some of the, the hadith and they are saying, you know, when the whole world around you is corrupt, the only thing that you have to do is isolate yourself, protect yourself. Okay. It's one understanding of some of the hadith. I don't agree with this. I don't agree that you have to isolate and to just to save your soul and, and your, your, your uh, self and that's it. I understand that, yes, you have to find the right distance when you feel that you can be corrupt, that you can be lost, but you need to come within the society and to uh, be equipped to change it. So it's an understanding. And it's sometimes the problem that we may have. And in all that I mentioned, so once again, is, is what is your contribution in culture? What is your contribution even in politics? Even in politics. What is your contribution today about the, this, the, 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 the current discourse on democracy? Are you happy with the democratic processes within which you are living? Or do you, can you contribute? Not as people talking from outside. You know, for example, I, I wrote the book uh, to be, uh, no, the, the Quest for Meaning, and someone was responding to the book saying, Tariq Ramadan is an outsider who has the problem of uh, talking to us as if he was insider with outside reference. I said, the problem is him. It's not me. Why am I outside? Because I am a Muslim. So the problem with him is with being a Muslim, talking about inside or domestic problems is not possible. There is a contradiction in terms, in his mind, not in my reality. So you have to deconstruct this by saying, no, I'm within and I'm talking as you, uh, as a European, as a British or as a Swiss or whatever. So these are the priorities and, 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 and it's important uh, uh, now to get that. The requirements now that I wanted when it comes to uh, applied ethics. There is something which is clear. If we want an effective, efficient uh, applied ethics, it's clear that the reference should be known. So if you are not equipped with the Islamic knowledge, you should have people on, on, on whom you rely to give you the knowledge, the efficient knowledge. It could be scholars, and it should be scholars. For example, in these workshops that we are setting, the scholars are here. There is no applied Islamic ethics with, without a deep, specialized knowledge of the text in specific issues. So this is where uh, uh, it's, it's the requirement is, how do we translate this? There is no effective 
influence and positive influence and impact on reality if you are not equipped with the knowledge, first of course, of the text, which objectives do you want to achieve? And then the knowledge, as I said yesterday, the knowledge of the specific field that you are tackling. That there are things that you, can, you cannot get if you are not in a specific field. What you are talking about, for example, within the community, you should be within the community to get this knowledge, to get the tensions, to understand what is happening. So it's quite sophisticated. So the requirement is once again to come together with these two knowledge, uh, knowledges. No one today can pretend or can claim that he or she has the two knowledges. And this is where it's important now to connect the people, to connect the competencies, and, and to have people working, to, 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 to have a kind of synergy between the competencies that we have within the community. So, so once again, this year, these are the requirements in the light of the whole philosophy that we have. Are we ready? Are we clear on what is our contribution to change this, the world for the better wherever we are, and especially for us here in the West? The last point, uh, 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 something which is important in the requirements as well, and this is uh, how we get the knowledge, is this sense of confidence that we have something to give. It's missing among us. Many Muslims are uh, reacting to the West and not always sure that they have something to give. Sometimes because they don't know their religion and uh, sometimes because uh, there, is, there is a lack of understanding of their society and, and the people. There is an inferiority complex here intellectually, very often. We look at ourselves as dominated, not able to, uh, to deliver on any of the fields. And if we look at what we are doing now, when we speak about sciences, we said, oh, there was a time when the Muslims were very, very uh, much contributing in sciences. There was a time where we have architecture in Andalus, and we go there just, it's the past. And unfortunately, some of our scholars are giving us the impression that all the great scholars are scholars of the past. You know, the great Abu Hanifa, the great Shafi'i. And it's as if now they are less great and not so uh, knowledgeable. And I think that this is unfair. Yes, they were great, but greatness is, is still among us, that you, ha you, you have people who are doing their best and, and they are great minds, great Muslim minds. So we have to be confident with what we can uh, provide our humanity with and, and what we can do. And, and this is where we need these qualities that are sometimes missing. I would say spiritual humility and intellectual ambition. Intellectual ambition is to say with the spiritual humility is I rely on Allah, but we can make it. It's possible. A kind of reconciliation. But it's also important sometimes to have the opposite, which is spiritual ambition that I can change and intellectual humility. That never let anyone give you the impression that you cannot change for the better, that you are who you are and that's it. No, I can change. This is spiritual ambition. I can do it. So you are not here to judge me. I can do it. If Allah wants, I can do it. And you have seen this, so spiritual ambition is also important, and intellectual modesty and humility is important. And I'm also talking about intellectual modesty, which is also sometimes missing among us. But, you know, this kind of spiritual take, which is a kind of a sense of confidence that uh, this strength should come out of our spirituality, that la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah means something, that it's possible. And, and, and and it's important to, to, to speak about this because I don't want you to understand all this as a, an intellectual exercise. You know, it's, you come, oh, it's just about ethics, intellect, legal things, and no, it's a spiritual exercise. It's a spiritual experience. It's a spiritual experience that, uh, yes, with this connection, this faithfulness, this tawakkul ala Allah, it's possible. That so, so it's this spiritual humility and can make it that you can see with your intelligence, with your intellect, if, you are, if your heart is open, things that 
Your mind without your heart cannot see. And this is your contribution. You should to put some heart in effective uh, rationalism or efficient rationalism. It's, this is our contribution. And, and you know why today in our societies, and it's not only in the West, it's also in the Muslim majority countries, when there is no heart in rationality, rationality needs emotions. So, <laughs> you know how it's called in Islam, a shirk al-khafi? A shirk al-khafi is when you are with God with your heart and you put your heart in rationality, your rationality is nurtured by something which is your heart. But if there is no this heart with aligned rationality, your rationality needs something else and it's going to be emotions. And emotions could be idols. This is why the people sometimes, they think that they pray when they listen to music. This is why some people have exactly the same attitude when they are following a football match. It's like a prayer. It's all the emotions. You know what it is, this? Shirk. Sure. International shirk, just in front of you. Because there is something which is with so much emphasis on efficient rationality, without the heart, without spirituality, you need something else. It's going to come from emotion. Our contribution is to a balance here. And this is applied ethics as well, this balance. is about heart and mind. Because if you focus on the minds, minds need emotion. At its important is the way even you speak about love. You know, it's very difficult to make it clear for people you have to learn to love because I don't need to learn to love because love is love coming like this. Emotional love, yes. Spiritual love, no. You are not asked only to love your father and your mother through an emotional love, but the spiritual love. And you have to educate yourself to get that. It's deeper than that. You understand my point here? It's, 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 it's very central. It's very, the, the, it's, it's very much the requirement in which way we have to deal with this and not to, 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 uh, um, uh, to be misled. And the methodology, once again, is really, uh, uh, as I said, you know this uh, uh, group of scholars of the text and scholars of the context working together. But for us today, the methodology should be this one is to look at a, a specific field and to ask ourselves what are the questions that are still unanswered and challenging for today. And to try to find a way to put them in the right way to get at least, if not a complete solution, the steps towards solution. So sometimes you may have a very sensitive challenge, a sensitive problem and, and, and questions. Try to think about it, what do I want to solve and what are the steps. Knowing that you are not only dealing with text, that you are dealing with a society, with a community. So what I want the methodology today is to be quite strict with you, not only by thinking the problem, but translating the questions. You understand what I mean? I want you to think about the way you put the questions as something which is as essential as the way we are trying to get the answers when you are dealing with the specifics. For example, we are later, we'll, uh, we, we'll come with, I will, I will talk about medical sciences as an introduction, but when we speak about arts and when we speak about gender, what are the questions that are sensitive? And don't come with the general question, just try to think about the questions, the way they should be put in the light of the text and in the light of the community, trying to get what are the priority questions and what are the secondary questions. Try to organize your questions in the light of the text and in the light of the context. This is where you are useful because your work is, is getting a sense of, you know, you have a methodology of questioning the text and a methodology of questioning the community. You know? You have to be very, very, to be frank, without pedagogy, it's counterproductive. You have to go to someone and say, you know what, I'm going to tell you the truth. You're a silly boy. Okay. Is this a teacher? 
It's not a teacher, it's a silly teacher who is saying to his student, you are a silly student. To be bold and, you know, to say things is, truth is very important in Islam. Allah Ta'ala is talking to human beings, telling them the truth in a specific way. He knows human beings. You know you, the, the, the people you are dealing with. You need to know, you know, what is cultural in the way you are communicating? The way you are communicating is very cultural in Britain. You know, even your, as I said, your sense of humor and all this, it's very cultural, how you are communicating. So when you ask questions, you need to get this in mind. How do I put the question in order to get the right answers coming from this community? You are responsible of the way you put the questions, the priority questions as well as all the questions. And, and this is what I want us to do in these four fields that we are going to study today. Okay, this is part of the methodology which is not exactly what I would do with the scholars of the text and the context when they are, working in the, they are coming to the workshop. But it's quite important before they meet, for example, to come with a series of questions that they are put with a, a specific uh, understanding of what are the challenges. But this is not what we are doing, going to do today. That's it. Priorities, requirements, and methodology. So it's, it's demanding. I, I really want you when we are going to, I want you to be more interactive today, to think about the, some of the areas that you think that we have to tackle, and to think not only in a simple way, oh, this is a problem, let us talk about this problem. No, I want you to say, this is a problem, what are the questions? And in which way you are going to organize your questions? You get that? Okay, that, uh, uh, this, is the, this is the first session here. Yeah.